So this is Jacob Hansen. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of an intro uh, to the video work that we're going to be doing for this winter um, by first kind of giving you a little bit of background. Um, as far as coaching goes, um, it's very rare that I have um, any of my own ideas. One of the things uh, about 15 years ago was I sought to train under people that knew more than I did. And the three people that I want to really credit um, is Peter Burwash, Vic Braden, and Steve Smith. They've been three of the biggest influences. And I've found that their ideas have withstood the test of time. So um, as we work through the winter, um, I want you guys to have a kind of a clear idea of kind of my teaching philosophy. Um, I'm wanting to work and get these kids solid fundamentals. The reality is that if there's inefficiencies in the game, um, your child can only get so far in tennis. And that's what we tend to find as we look at the top players in the state, they have less and less inefficiencies. Uh, so they're able to repeat, get the ball back in court. And with this video here, I want to just give you an idea of what a really good looking, simple, repeatable shot looks like. And a lot of our kids may not get to this level uh, this winter, but I want you guys to have an idea of what we're going for. So you're going to notice that the strokes here are very simple. There's nothing complicated about what these kids are doing. It's not easy, but there's not a lot of uh, wrist play. There's not a lot of um, changing of the racket face. It's a very simple, repeatable movement that takes a long time to get really good at, but it's very efficient. And I want you to have this vision in your mind as I take you through the rest of this video. We're going to see a lot of players uh, at the professional level, um, and I'm going to use them to demonstrate what I actually think makes a shot high level or efficient and some of the issues that we typically see with um, amateur players. And so I'm hoping you're going to get a really clear picture. Um, you're going to be better educated in terms of understanding what we're going to try to do this um, winner with your kids game. Thanks. So I want to talk about a few of the important fundamentals on the serve. This is JJ Wolf. The first thing I want to point out is how he already has his front shoulder turned to his opponent. So notice he has coiled before he's going to toss. This is important because it allows him to have good upper body rotation and then look at his lower half. Notice the knees point towards us. That tells us he's already coiled the lower half, and that's going to allow for a great kinetic chain. The idea with a kinetic chain is it always starts from the ground up. So now he's going to uncoil the lower half. It's going to go into the shoulder, the body, and then into the shoulder and down into the racket. So that is the kinetic chain action that we're looking for. It's not a jump. It's an uncoil. The, the jump itself is a byproduct of all the energy being released. Oftentimes players think that they need to jump on their serve, but what this does is it disrupts the kinetic chain and stops their uncoil. So the next thing I want to point out here is the racket angle. The racket angle is closed as it comes over his head. This is important because this is what allows us to hit up on the serve. If you have an open racket face, you have to pull down on the ball you're somebody that hits yourself in the shin a lot that's probably because you have an open racket face that requires you to use your wrist to then pull down on the ball the other thing i want to point out here real quick we hear this phrase scratch the back i want you to notice that the racket is actually not close to scratching his back there's a good distance there this is important because this allows us to get a lot of power when we scrunch ourselves up into the back the hand is too close to our head and we end up Scratching the back, we lose a ton of power because our body is too close to itself. The other thing I want to point out here is that the wrist is relatively passive. There's no flipping of the wrist on the serve. He pronates from the shoulder and the forearm. And now watch how his strings actually point to the right of uh, the camera. That's because he's pronated from the forearm and not from the wrist for power. 
The last thing I'll point out is notice that he's still sideways, relatively close to being 45 degrees here. It's only now that he actually fully squares up to his opponent. So those are some key things we wanna look for on the serve. We wanna make sure we're developing a palm down, closed racket face serve, and that we have this understanding that the racket, that the serve is an uncoiling of the body and that it is not a jump in a pulling down motion. So one thing I want to revisit on the JJ Wolf serve is the height of the toss. So notice he turns the body um, forward. Notice where his racket is. Right as the racket's releasing, it's almost already up in this hitting position. So when you have a down together, up together serve, it requires a much higher toss because your tossing arm is going to be closer um, to the ground than what JJ Wolf's is here. So this is fantastic because it, oh, look at the height of the toss. It's no higher pretty much than what he needs to reach with his racket. We want a low toss for a couple reasons. It allows us to have really good rhythm. The second thing is the higher a toss is, the faster the ball falls, the faster the ball falls, it moves quicker through our strike zone or our contact point, and it becomes more and more difficult to actually hit. So we wanna eventually learn how to get a low toss, and that's very easy to do if you have the right fundamentals, and that's something we're gonna to work towards over this winter. Okay, we're gonna look at Serena Williams' forehand here. First thing we're going to point out is the the um, unit turn. So right away she recognizes forehand coming. And notice her unit turn and the fact that the racket goes high. So we want to make sure that the racket goes high. The other thing I want to point out, and we can't see it from here, is that her elbow is not tucked in next to her body. The elbow is going to rise up. Okay, that's going to create some space. The racket goes high, and now I want you to see how the racket is going to close. We can see that the racket is now pointed uh, towards the ground. This is really important that when she starts to come down to the bottom of her swing, she's got a closed racket face right here. The closed racket face is incredibly important because it allows us to swing away from our body. Notice it's an inside close to her body swing at this point, and it swings away from her. This is the number one pe reason why a lot of players don't have top spin is because they get the racket outside of the ball and swing inside, creating a merry-go-round type of a swing. Whereas what she's going to do is she's going to swing inside out away from her body, and then she's going to finish it by almost creating a Ferris wheel effect. It's a lifting pattern coming out of her shoulder socket. And notice how high her racket finishes and she's kissing her bicep there. That's because the main driver in terms of the upper body um, is gonna be the shoulder, okay? A lot of times people think that the wrist is super active or that they're doing something with the forearm, but notice that the shoulder socket is the only way that you get this high of a finish. The other thing I wanna now point out is notice the knees. The knees bend as the racket drops and watch where they're going to finish. They're almost completely straight. Okay. You can see the back, the rear leg. She's on her tippy toes. So we know that she's had weight transfer. We know that she's had rotation because her hips now point towards us. Um, so it's really key that we understand the legs and the shoulder socket work in conjunction with one another. And the wrist is relatively passive. So those are some of the main things I want you to be aware of on the forehand. So quick review, we got a unit turn, the elbow will raise, the racket will go high, it will drop with a closed racket face. She swings inside out and lifts out of the legs and the shoulder socket to get true, true top spin on the ball. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at Novak Djokovic's backhand. Of all the players I recommend copying, Djokovic is the most um, efficient one you can copy. He has the least amount of moving parts, and that's why he tends not to miss. So first thing I want you to look for is 
we're coming right into our unit turn. Notice that the right arm is already straight and that the racket is high, meaning he's starting what we could call a Ferris wheel effect where the racket starts high, it goes down low, and it's gonna finish back up high. So really important to understand that. The other thing I wanna point out is notice that the racket is on edge. Even maybe slightly closed, it's hard to tell from our camera angle, but the racket is not open towards the sky. So notice as he steps out into his drop, you're gonna notice that the left, his left arm is gonna straighten out, but he has not broken his wrist. Sometimes players like to come to this point and then drop their wrist so that their racket head is way below. And what we tend to find is those players have very weak backhands because the wrist, the left wrist gets in such a weak position. So notice that even when the racket drops, it's really, there's just a straightening and a lowering from the legs that gets his racket down here. So the next thing we want to point out is notice the racket angle now is even more closed. And so that's going to be really important because a closed racket face, just like on the forehand, allows us to have the racket very close to our body and it allows us to then swing away from our body. So notice Djokovic swings from inside the body to away from his body. And you can see that left arm is once again relatively straight. So it signifies he's not pulling in towards his body. He's getting his swing as far away as he can. So from here, he's below the ball. He comes up, he, he swings inside out, hits the ball. And now he's gonna continue to lift from the shoulder sockets. And we're gonna see that he is gonna finish on the left side of his body almost. Notice that the racket points to the left. And this is important to know because we now know he didn't flip his wrist on the backhand. Sometimes people talk about flipping the wrist or using the wrist to hit a lot on the backhand. But notice that the rack, the wrist position on the finish. <clears throat> the other thing that's important to notice is that he can almost kiss his left bicep. So that tells us once again that the shoulders are lifting up through the shot. And notice he's going to finish relatively tall in relation to where he started. So he's getting a ground force lifting action out of the body in addition to using the shoulder sockets like a Ferris wheel. Okay, we're gonna take a quick look at the forehand volley here. Um, first thing I'm gonna point out, um, this is Djokovic in practice. So he's got a ball in his hand. Normally, he obviously won't have a ball in his hand, but he's got, once again, his left hand supporting the racket as he makes his unit turn. The big thing I want to point out is that the volley is coming out of the shoulder socket. And the reason we know this is because we're going to notice that the elbow is bent right here as he goes into the volley. So the volley, so the elbow is slightly bent, and we're going to look at the finish. It still has some bend in it. So this tells us that he's not using the, um, sometimes people call it a punch in terms of going bent to straight with the elbow for the power, it's really coming out of that shoulder socket. The other thing I want to point out is how level the racket path is. It really could slide along a bookshelf. A lot of times we see people hacking down on the ball and that's the reason they're doing that is because they have too open of a racket face. And we wanna think about the volley, the racket angle is usually gonna be less than 10 degrees open the better, if you can think of Pete Sampras and his great volley back in the day, he had a relatively closed face, but he had really good racket path. So the, the, more, le the more closed the racket angle is, the more it's towards perpendicular, we can really have a clean path through the ball. The more that we open the racket face, we end up having to chop down on the ball and we want to avoid that. The last thing I'll kind of point out is notice the step with the hit, notice as he crosses that left leg is landing right as he's hitting or maybe a little bit after. Sometimes people think that you land first with the leg and you volley. That's not true. When you land first with your leg, you're gonna tend to pull down because you're gonna stop your momentum and the racket's gonna pull down into the ground.
Okay, we're gonna look quickly at the backhand volley. First thing I want you to notice is that the left hand is on the throat of the racket, it's not down low. So anytime you're hitting a one-handed backhand volley, you wanna have racket control. Notice the index finger is on the strings, that comes from Peter Burwash. Um, so notice as the unit turn happens that the right arm is straight and the left elbow is elevated. This is really important. Number one, the left elbow out being elevated keeps the racket face from being open. So if you can imagine if this gentleman's elbow dropped down, you would see his racket face start to open up towards the sky, which you do not want. The importance of the right arm being straight is that it forces us to volley out of the shoulder socket. A lot of people volley from um, their elbows, meaning they'll go straight elbow to bent elbow or bent to straight, that's most common. And the problem with that is you can get a 10 to 15 degree variation in your racket angle at contact. And we want the least amount of variables to have to account for. So from here, I want you to notice the path that the racket takes. It's like it's on a tabletop or a bookshelf. And there is no calculating from the wrist. Notice how stable the wrist is as it moves through here. The more calculations that you have to make, the more you change the racket angle, the less consistent you're going to be. So the last thing I'll point out is that the foot and the strike on the ball happen in unison. That's gonna be on most volleys, not all of the time, but you're gonna see that there is uh, a coordination between the lower half and the upper half. Um, I'm hoping that we start to see the pathway that, you know, the pros cannot violate any sort of physical laws. So we really important that we as tennis consumers, we watch it on TV, especially for the kids, they start to understand what style and what substance. So um, hopefully that gives you a firm foundation uh, to start to um, understand the work that we're going to do this winter. I also generally advocate do not try to coach your kids unless you've got a really good understanding of this. Um, if you're going to be involved with your child in their tennis, I recommend feeding tons of balls um, That's a, and choosing targets for them to hit to. Um, but typically, the um, uh, teaching uh, can sometimes get confusing if you don't have a real clear understanding on it. Thank you.